Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. Psalms 37, 5 through 7. It says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the new day. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his ways, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. I know a lot of life has been led this week and this month, but there's tax season, there's a bunch of stuff coming up, but we can rest in the presence of the Lord. So can we praise him and bring him into this place right now? Dear Lord Jesus, God, bless this service today. Lord, bless all the people that are here, Jesus. Lord, bless them in the holy way. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, yes. What a mighty God we serve. Omega, he's the heavenly father. 
of all ages. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end. Much more than this, my friend. He's the Son of Man. He's coming back again. I know Jesus is the Father. I know Jesus is the Son. Oh, hey. Jesus is the Holy Ghost, and all these three are one. Let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the rock of all ages. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end. Much more than this, my friend. He's the Son of Man. Jesus is the Holy Ghost, and all these three are one. Let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the rock of all ages. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, he's the Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end. Much more than this, my friend. He's the Son of Man. He's coming back again. Rock of all ages, he's the Alpha and the Omega, yes, he is. he's the Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end, much more than this, my friend, he's the Son of Man, he's coming back again. I know Jesus is the Father, I know Jesus is the Son. I know Jesus is the Holy Ghost, and all these three are one. Let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the rock of all ages. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Heavenly Father, the beginning and the end. Much more than this, my friend. He's the Son of Man. He's coming back again. right now. Can you lift up your voice to him? Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, God. Oh, the mighty God is Jesus. The Prince of Peace is he. The everlasting Father is the King eternally. The wonderful in wisdom by whom all things were made. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is his name. Oh, Glory. 
worship you today. We magnify you today for you have no rival. You have no equal. Lord, there is none beside you, Lord. Oh, you're all powerful, Lord. You are all holy, Lord. You are great, Lord. You are the only one that sits on the throne. You're the only one that reigns forever and ever and ever, God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's just praise him today. Let's magnify him today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we praise you today. We worship you today, Lord. We love you today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the beginning and the end of the Alpha and the Omega. Oh, he is the one that created us. He's the one that is still living. He's the one that is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, somebody right now, we're just right now, start praying in the Holy Ghost. Start speaking to the Holy Ghost. Right now, oh hallelujah! Oh, thank you,
Aleluia. Let's worship him. Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. Worship you, Lord. We praise you. We magnify you, God. Oh, yes, Lord. We exalt you today. We lift you up today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. Go Oh, you, God. Oh, worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great word from our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I want to do some quick prayer requests. Hallelujah. Pray. Uh, prayer request from uh, Becky for her mom, Tanya Rogers. She needs a healing in her body that we're going to pray for God to touch her body today. Amen. And for uh, Tisha, for a special unspoken, God will move. Amen. He knows what's going on. We're going to pray for his will to be done in that situation. Hallelujah. Praying for youth convention. That is this week. All right. Praying for God's spirit to be there. All the night services, everybody's invited. You know, you can come for free. Um, the information of where to get to is on the poster. But if you guys can't make it, do keep in prayer for it. Amen. We're praying for this younger generation. Praying for God to touch them. They need to be raised up in the ways that they should go. But we're praying for God to get a hold of them so that they could want to be in God's will, to be walking in God's will. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to continue to pray for Salem, Oregon. God is moving. Amen. I want to see God move more. I want to see what God really wants to do. He is moving. There's, there's, there's cogs turning somewhere that God is moving that we don't see, but God's like, oh, get ready. Get ready. It's around that corner. It's around that corner. Praying for God that we can, can continue in the faith of what he is going to do in this city. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need prayer today, you can come up. We will pray for you. We will anoint you and pray for you. God to touch you. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to God in prayer right now. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you that you are the one that sits on the throne. We thank you that you are our healer, God. You are, Lord, our way maker, God. That, Lord, you are the only one that sits on the throne. That, Lord, no one is beside you, God. We thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for your promise, Lord, that you're always with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. Hallelujah, Lord. We ask you, Lord, right now to touch, Lord, Sister Tanya Rogers, God, that, Lord, you would heal her body right now. Oh, in the name of Jesus, that her body would be healed. Her, her spirit would be, Lord, lifted up, God. That, Lord, you would touch her. That, Lord, you would strengthen her, Lord. Be with her, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We ask you that, Lord, you would touch, Lord, touch her, God. That, Lord, you see her need. That, Lord, you provide for her, God. Provide for her need right now. We praise you for it. We thank you for it today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your touch. Thank you, Lord, for your healing today. Hallelujah. We pray, Lord, for youth convention this week, God. That, Lord, you would touch, Lord, this, the young people, Lord, of Oregon, God. Oh, Lord, draw them to you, Jesus. Let their hearts be open to you, Lord, this week, God. Oh, Lord, touch them in a mighty way. Let your spirit, Lord, be in this convention, God. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. We pray, Lord, right now for Salem, Oregon, God, that you are moving, God. That, Lord, we pray for you to continue to move, Lord. Oh, Lord, let your spirit, Lord, fall out, Lord, in Salem, Oregon, God. Let it fall out, Lord, wherever we go, Lord. Let us see it happen, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's praise God right now. Let's exalt him today. Oh, how great he is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated for a moment as Brother Chantry comes with the announcements. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Uh, next Thursday at 7 o'clock is prayer, 730 Bible study. Um, some of us will not be here. We'll be at youth convention, as uh, my brother uh, has announced. I feel kind of useless right now because he kind of did most of the announcing, but oh well, I'll make it up. I'll, I'll make up something. Amen. Uh, then next Sunday at uh, 2 o'clock is 2.30. Amen. Please come to that. And then as, as for mentioned... Youth convention is this week. Amen. March 29th through the 31st, please come. Or at the night, it's free to come. And if you want to go, you can go. If you don't want to go, we won't try to hunt you down. I, I'll have better things to do anyway. Anyway, uh, and then to announce uh, on Easter is also coming up. It is on the 9th of April. And for Easter Sunday, we'll be taking up a offering, uh, Save Our Children's Offering. And this Save Our Children's Offering helps support SOC rallies, which I'm not sure what they are. Save Our Children's Offering. Yeah, why don't you just write that down and say SOC, <laughs> trying to figure out acronyms over here. Anyway, Save Our Children's Rallies, which that helps get, you know, we bring the children in and there's a speaker and pray through the Holy Ghost, and that's in the U.S. and overseas, oversee orphanages, junior Bible quizzing, and our own Oregon Junior Camp. So that's what it all supports, and we are only going to do uh, one day, and that's going to be on Easter. So, I believe that is all the announcements. So let's stand. Amen. Except before, I felt kind of useless, but... But uh, this, th there, there's a thing called March Madness that's going on, and there was this team, you know, has a $100 million facility with them paying millions of dollars with their coach, and they got beat by a team called Fairling Dickinson. And um, they, let's say this, um, it's, it's bad. It's like, it's like, um, dog, I don't know what it's like losing to Fairling Dickinson because I don't know where Fairling Dickinson is. Anyway, anyway, let, let's stay away from that. And let's pray for our offering. Dear Lord Jesus, God, bless the people give us a hundredfold. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's march. In the name of
hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Aren't you glad for the name of Jesus today? Amen. In his name, you shall speak with new tongues. In his name, you shall cast out devils. In his name, you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. They shall recover. Amen. Praise God. Amen. What a name. Amen. And all that it represents. Praise God. Amen. Amen. As you stand today, take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts, the ninth chapter. Amen. We want to take our passage from there today. Wow. What a wonderful spirit of God that's been in this place. Amen. And just a quick note of teaching what you uh, uh, just received was what we call the message of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Chantry brought the tongues, and then I interpreted what God had to say. If some of you thought in your heart of what I was saying was in your heart to say, then God's trying to talk to you about bringing a message, amen, of interpretation of tongues. I believe God wants that gifting in this church. Amen. And I don't mind doing it. Amen. But God wants some of you to do it. Because when you begin to do it, you get involved with the Spirit of God. Amen. And so that when you're out there on the street, Amen. God can speak to you a word and you can give it to whoever needs it. That's what God wants you to grow to. That's what God wants you to become. A vessel, a gift. Amen. To this world. Amen. Thank God for doing it in the church. But this is really where we learn so that we can go there and operate in the gifts of the Spirit. The world want, needs to see the glory of God. The way they see the glory of God is through the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. In their life. Every time, many times, amen, and I'm not preaching yet, so just endure me for a second, amen. But many times in the book of Acts, God moves through the gift of miracles. And through those gift of miracles, people believe on the Lord. What we just, what we just witnessed just a few moments ago is, a part, is of that same gifting, the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. You can read it in 1 Corinthians 12. It also talks about the gift of miracles, the gift of healing, the gift of faith, the gift of wisdom, amen, the gift of prophecy, all that. That's what we're seeing. And church, God doesn't just want to do it here, but he wants to teach you it here so you can do it out there. There's some people that need healing today that you know that I'll never meet until they come to church. But they'll never come until you pray for them. Acts, the ninth chapter. And so, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell on the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Amen. Amen. We are in, our, we are in a, a, a vein of teaching, preaching right now. Amen. On the book of Acts. And we've gone through eight chapters already. And now we're in chapter nine. And it's from this today, amen, that I want to preach to you in one moment. In one moment. Lord, we love you. We praise you today. We magnify you. We exalt you today, God, because you are great and greatly to be praised. God, Lord, you want to do great things in the families that are represented here today. You are wanting to do great things, Lord, in the lives of those that see us on, on the internet right now. You're wanting to do great things, God. You are wanting to reveal yourself to this world in a powerful, dynamic way. And so, Lord, we're asking for revelation to take place in this service, that our eyes be open to the power and the might and the glory of God, that we would, God, truly, God, Lord, see your work manifest Manifested before us, Lord Jesus, in your name, that there'd be great healings, that there'd be great miracles, Lord, that there would be words of prophecy and words of wisdom issued forth from this church into this city, God, into the cities around us, that many, 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 many boys, 
girls, men, women would see your truth and come to serve you and believe on you, as the scripture has said. In Jesus' name, let it be done. In Jesus' name, let it be accomplished. In Jesus' name, let it be fulfilled, we pray. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory from the depths of our soul today. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Amen. amen. You may be seated today. Amen. Saul. Saul. Who is Saul? When you first read about the life of Saul, we've already went through the chapter, but I want you to reflect back on chapter 7 of the book of Acts. You remember Stephen, the one that stood and declared to them the whole counsel of God. Even as he was preaching to them, his face would glow with the glory of God. But ultimately, they would throw him, in verse 58, cast him out of the city, speaking of Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. The very next chapter, chapter 8, we read in Acts 8, and Saul was consenting unto his death, Stephen's death. And at, that, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And again, we see Saul. As for Saul, he made havoc. Yeah, that's in the Bible. Havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. What a nice man he is. What a wonderful asset he is to the kingdom of God. As he is wreaking havoc, that's probably not the last time I'll use it today because it just jumps out at me, amen. Havoc of the church. Destroying the church is his goal. He wants to stamp out this heresy. He wants to stamp out this false witness. He wants to stamp out this, this horrendous teaching of Jesus Christ. Paul would say of himself later in later years in Philippians 3, 5 through 6, he would say, I was circumcised when I was eight years old. This is from the New Living Translation. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Paul, amen, that later would become Saul, that would later, amen, not that God changed his name in my opinion, Amen. But Saul to the to, to the to the uh, Hebrew, Amen. And Paul to the to the Greek, Amen. Same name, just a different uh, translation and different uh, 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 language, Amen. In my opinion, Amen. There are some that preach that God changes. I just don't see it in Scripture. I'm just I don't see that in Scripture. I just all of a sudden Saul's starting to become. He's the writer just starts using the word Paul, Amen. And so, but what did he see himself? He saw himself as a Pharisee, a strict Pharisee, who believed what? What did the Pharisees believe? They believed in one God. They were very adamant about that. In fact, the Jewish people had gone through a horrible time during the days of King Nebuchadnezzar because they did not worship the one true God. And so in his zeal, in his zeal for the things of God and in strict obedience to the Jewish law, he persecuted. More than that, he was trying to destroy the followers of this man called Jesus. He became the most feared man in all Judea and even beyond. He was zealous about what he was doing because he strongly believed he was right. He harshly, the Bible says, persecuted the church. He made havoc of the followers of Jesus Christ. 
He imprisoned not just men, but women also, which was really unheard of. But he was zealous about stamping out this heresy that said that Jesus was Lord. He was a member of the religious group that most opposed Jesus during his earthly ministry, the Pharisees. The religious group that really had its hand in destroying Christ. He consented, as I've already told you, which means oversaw the death of Stephen, the church's first martyr. He uttered out threats and eagerly, I said eagerly, killed the Lord's followers. One could say that Saul hated the church and everything that the church stood for. He was truly the worst enemy of the early church. We are not sure how long Saul persecuted the church, but we find this enemy of Jesus Christ, this enemy of the followers of Christ, receiving permission to go to Damascus and bring back both men and women bound to Jerusalem. But God has something else in mind. For we read, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he filled, and he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It was there that Saul received one of the greatest revelations concerning who God is. Who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Lord? And there the answer came, amen. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Saul's whole problem with the followers of Jesus was that Jesus had declared himself more than just a man. If Jesus would have just kept it to him that he was a prophet, if Jesus would have just kept it that he was just another man like they were, it would have been okay. But Jesus said he was more than that. He was, in fact, uh, amen, he called himself the Son of God. That is why Jesus was crucified. Jesus declaring himself to be God in the eyes of the strictest of the pharisaical religion. Jesus was blaspheming, making himself equal to God. That is why when Peter declared in Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, it was quite a statement. For Peter was saying that this humanity, this man, this person, amen, this being, amen, uh, was more than just humanity. They knew he was human. They spent day after day with him. They were there when he talked. They were there when he ate. They were there when they did a whole lot of walking. And I don't know how much, but they did do some sleeping somewhere. Jesus slept right there with them. Remember, he slept in the boat. They knew he was man. They had no problem with that. But was he more than just a man? Peter was saying in this statement, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus, you're more than a man. You are God. That you are God. The people during Christ's earthly ministry knew Jesus was human, but struggled with him being divine. We today believe that Jesus is divine, but we struggle with him being human. We struggle that Jesus can be called the Son of God. Many of us will say, why did Jesus just not use that term? Why, why use the term son? Why, why even involve that term in his ministry and, and that be spoken about him? Because we don't want to hear about the son. We just know that Jesus is God. The creators of Trinity, and I say that because that's what it was. The creators, the makers, the inventors of the, uh, of the doctrine of, of the Trinity made Jesus, the son, coexistent, co-eternal, and co-powerful. Now I'm just asking you, as we look at this, how can a son be co-existent, co-eternal, and co-powerful? 
It's a son. That means he had a beginning. So how can he be coexistent, co-eternal, and co-powerful? Thus, they invented it this way and said, well, he's the second person. Or it used to be said, the second God of the tri, uh, uh, of the Trinity of God. But according to scripture, the Bible strongly states there is but one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Isaiah would prophesy in Isaiah 43 and 10. I hope you got a pen because we're fixing to go through scripture. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Beside me there is no Savior, neither before me nor after me, for I alone am God. Isaiah went on to say in Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, Lord, the King of of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Sounds like Revelations a little bit when Jesus says, I am the first, and I am the last, I am the Alpha, and I am the Omega. Amen. If there's only one God, then that makes it. I'm getting way ahead of myself because I got good notes today. But Jesus is God. Amen. Manifest in the flesh. Praise God. Amen. That there is a, a need, amen, on our understanding that the Son must be used. We'll get to that in a moment. Isaiah went on to say, in Isaiah 45, 21, Tell ye... And bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this ancient time. Who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord. And there is no God beside me. A just God and Savior. There is none beside me. A just God and Savior. And Savior. We know Jesus as what? The Savior of the world. But God said there's only one, and I'm him. So either Jesus was blaspheming, or Jesus was more than just a man. Either Jesus was lying, either Jesus was full of false doctrine, and we need to kick Jesus out of the church, or we need to understand that Jesus is who he said he was. He was God, more than just a man. There are other scriptures that I could go into concerning that God beside that there's only one God. But our issue is why God, why does God use the term son when referring to Jesus? That's the issue. We have no problem knowing God is the Father. We have no problem knowing God is the Holy Spirit. Because God is a spirit, obviously. And if God's a spirit, then he's a Holy Spirit. But we do struggle with the term son. With the help of the Lord, I want to to show you why the term son is the exact perfect of all perfect terms to use when you refer to Jesus Christ. You turn to Luke 1. What's going on here? An angel is coming to Mary. It's almost Christmas time. All those that love Christmas, praise God. About nine months away, amen. Actually, it is about nine months away, amen. Whoa, wow, I nailed that one, amen, praise God. But an angel's appearing to Mary. And he says in Luke 1, verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give him unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jumping down over verse 34 to verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. 
Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was a son. The incarnation or manifestation of God in the flesh, according to 1 Timothy 3.16. God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, was his father. We understand that it takes both a father and a mother to have a child. Come on, that's, that, that, that's a simple life. It takes a father and a mother. I hate to say it, that's what it should be, a father and a mother. Today, we, we, we have to learn it. It just takes a male and a female. That's sad because that destroys marriage and that destroys family. I'm not going there, but I'm just telling you, that's a sad thing. But it takes a father and a mother to have a child. The Holy Ghost was the father of Jesus Christ. So Jesus had every right, more than anybody that has that has ever lived or that has lived or ever will live to address God as father for he indeed was the son of God where the struggle comes for us today is understanding that Jesus was fully human we're okay with Jesus as God as oneness people we're okay with that we like Jesus is God but sometimes we struggle that Jesus was human that Jesus was fully human it appears that the moment somebody identifies Jesus' humanity, that, that makes him no longer divine. If one removes either part, I tell you, you remove the humanity of Christ, or you remove the divinity of Christ, the deity of Christ, Christ no longer exists. Jesus was God. I want my son to come up here real quick. Caleb. Can't, can't look at me a little bit, but I could have all four of my children up here, but I don't want to embarrass my girls. But if you look at this young man, you're going to see parts of me in him. Maybe through the way he's built, maybe the way, I'm just saying, you can see me in him. Probably with Caleb, you're going to probably see more the way he responds to things, probably like more like his dad. Okay? personality and all that, I built in him. If I walked his mother, I'm not going to embarrass her, but if she walked up here, you could see her in him. And if you take out what you see of me in him, he's no longer Caleb. If you take out what the Kasky side has put in him, he's no longer Caleb. If you take out the humanity of Christ, you destroy Christ. If you take out the deity of Christ, you destroy Christ. And that's what this world, that's what the Trinitary doctrine is trying to do. They're destroying the very image, the very person, the very thing that Christ was. That's why we can't go there. And that's the reason why, and I'm getting way ahead of me. I got thousands of scriptures. I spent time on this message, but I'm just feeling the Holy Ghost to tell somebody, amen. That's the reason why they, they preached Jesus everywhere they went, because they understood that this Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, amen, that he was more than just a human man, which they all understood him to be. That's what Paul thought him to be, amen. That's why Paul was so mad at everybody that followed him, because they were following a man, but they, he didn't understand until the day, that day, that moment, when God revealed himself to him, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, and all of a sudden went through his pharisaical mind that this is, hero Israel, the Lord our God, that's one Lord, is now manifested flesh, and now has become my Savior, and thus he deserves my praise and my worship and my obedience. You can't take one thing out of him. Thank you. He is indeed what he says. That's the reason why you will see in the discourses of Christ written in Scripture, especially in the book of John, that he refers to himself as son. A lot. And you see him talking to the Father. Why? Because Jesus recognizes who he is. He knows. If you remember when he was 12, I'm out of my notes, but if you remember when he was 12 years old, he was about what? His father's business, because he recognized as a 12-year-old, I'm more than just a, a, an ordinary boy. I'm more than just a human. Amen. But there's something in me. Amen. That's deity. Amen. And that deity, I have to obey it. Amen. I have to yield to it. I have to surrender to it. So that when I, the day comes, when I have to lay this humanity down on an old rugged cross, I know why I'm doing it for. Because I am 
I am letting God become the Savior of the world. That's why we cannot, we must not let it go. Thomas says, amen, in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. First John 5, 20 says it this way, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given unto us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life. It's, it's in your scriptures. I'm not making this up. Titus 2, 13 and 14 says it this way, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 declares it this way, to wit, that God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world unto himself, not, put it, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Galatians 4, 4 says, but when the fullness of time was come, God, was sent, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. God sent forth his flesh, amen, made under the law, uh, made of a woman, made under the law. 1 Corinthians 1, 15. I'm going too fast. You can always ask me later, amen, for these, for, for these scriptures. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones and dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Jesus Christ. John 14, verses 8 through 11. Jesus is there. He's fixing to have the Last Supper. He's fixing to go forth from here to the garden and then to the cross and then to the grave. And thank God, three days later, he came out of the grave, which we'll celebrate here in a couple weeks in a time called Easter. So he's here. And Philip tells him in verse 8 of John 14, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Hey, if you'll just show us, because then you begin to recognize that Jesus talked a lot about the Father. Just show us who that is. We know you're here and you're human, and we can see because you eat and drink like we do. But who is this Father that you're talking about? Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Who is he asking for? He's asking for the Father. And Jesus has said, I've been with you how long, and you don't even know me yet? You don't even understand me yet. You've seen all the stuff that I've done. You've seen all the miracles and all the wonderful things, and you don't even know me. He's asking for the Father, and Jesus' response is, Do you know me, Philip? For he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak, Unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. You got three, three, three you know, believe me that I'm in the Father, or you can believe that the Father is in me, or you can believe the works. Because I and my Father are one. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be, shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Jesus is God with us. John 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the book of John, the whole reason the book of John was written, remember, I, I've taught on this before, amen, I've preached this before, but I'm not going to quit preaching. Is that all right? I'm going to keep preaching it, amen, because I need you to understand. The book of John, one of the last physical books that were written in the hand of, of one of the disciples of God, the last, one of the last books, possibly the very last book, could be, amen, written, amen, of the New Testament. And he said this, for these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And then, probably the kicker, 
This is, if, you, if I haven't persuaded you yet that Jesus is the Father, like we so wonderf- wonderfully sang about today, then I give you this scripture. You're, you're still a doubting Thomas. Here's my pierced hands and pierced feet, okay? No, I don't have that. Christ did. I didn't. But here it is. Here, here is, the, to me, the scripture of all scriptures that should take this and totally solidify it in your mind. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, now listen to this, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Who are we talking about? We're talking about a baby being born. We're talking about a son being given. We're talking about somebody that's going to be born of a woman. And he's going to be the mighty God. But it doesn't stop there. He's not just the mighty God, but he's also what? The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Jesus is indeed God. Jesus is indeed human. He's fully God fully human. Through his ministry, he will operate and you will see it. And when you see son, from this point on, I hope you understand it's referring to the humanity of Christ, the the manifested fullness, the incarnation of God in human form. Now, I want you to know, like I I bring them up here again, if I didn't convince you, but Jesus was just as fully God as he was fully man. You can't take one and the other. You take one part of that, amen, and you remove it. How intricate is a father's effect on their child and a mother's effect? You can't can't cut and divide it. I know we always, that that one's got his nose, and and, and now, you know, they got her ears, and and we we, we go and try to dissect it all of trying to point out where the father shows up and where the mother shows up in, in, in the offspring. We try to do that. Because, but we do know one thing. You remove any of that, and that person doesn't exist. When you remove anything from Jesus from what he is, he, will send, he, he, he can't exist. He can't exist. He is fully God and fully man. And they're so, inter- uh, so intricately woven together that you can't separate the one from the other. That's why Jesus was more than just a man. That's why Jesus was more. He's the only being that's ever been like this. There will never be another being like it. How intricately woven together humanity and deity came to it. I know the Greeks tried their their gods and and the Romans tried their, but nobody can come like Jesus. Jesus was the one and only true being that, that has ever existed and ever will exist. That's why we call him the son of God. This is the main theme in the book of Acts in the early church. They went everywhere preaching Jesus Christ. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, what did he preach? Jesus Christ. Philip, to to the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch, what did he preach? Jesus. Many others preaching. Uh, Peter didn't just do it on the day of Pentecost. He did it it when he went to Cornelius' house. Paul, later on, well, he'll, he'll preach it to, to, to the disciples of, uh, of John the Baptist. What are they preaching? Jesus Christ. Amen. In fact, Paul will say, amen, later on, that he, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all I came, is preaching Jesus. Not with enticing words of man's wisdom, not with intellect, but just preaching Jesus. Church, I'm telling us today, we have got to preach Jesus to this world. Amen. You've got to stay with the message that Jesus is the only hope because he is the only hope. Jesus is the one that can seek and to save. Jesus is the one that can resurrect and make alive. Jesus is the one, amen, that can bring people out of their addictions. Jesus is the one that can change lives. Jesus is the one that can change a family. Jesus is the one. He's the only one. Amen. When we preach any other gospel, we're preaching a farce. We're, we're, we're preaching a, a, a false uh, doctrine. Jesus is God. And he's the one that we serve. As they fell down and worshiped Christ in his earthly ministry, you never hear them. We, never once does he rebuke them. In fact, the ten lepers, the one that came to worship him, 
fell down at his feet, he made him whole. Throughout scripture, angels would show up and people would try to worship them. The book of Revelations, John would try to worship the angel and the angel would always say, no, not me. I'm just an angel. You're not going to worship me. Another, another uh, reason or or, uh, 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 illustration that Jesus is God. This is what Saul saw for the first time. That indeed Jesus is Lord. The persecutor of the church who put fear in all that all the followers of Jesus, even Ananias, if you read on in chapter 9, would question the wisdom of God when he was told to go and pray for this man called Saul. The disciples, they wouldn't even receive him. It was Barnabas that had to take him aside because the disciples wouldn't. But Saul, later known through the writings of the book of Acts, Paul, preached Jesus and him crucified. He would write over half the New Testament. He would start several churches throughout Asia Minor. There is no history of the number of disciples and new converts that Paul reached. And Paul would say this about about it, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, blessed and blessing to preach, a, a, a blessing to preach Jesus Christ to all. Thus, in one moment of time, this is what I want to tell somebody today. In one moment, don't take away from what I preached about Jesus being Lord now, come on. But this is what I want to get across today at the closing of this service. Thus, in one moment of time, God turned the greatest enemy of the early church into the greatest spokesman of the early church in one moment of time. You look around, it looks impossible. You look at situations in your life, they seem they're always going to be there. You look at problems, amen, that seem to grow every day, and you feel like you're, there's no hope. There's no, not, nothing that you can help in. Nothing, there's just no way it's ever going to change. It's always been this way. It's always going to be this way, and I'm stuck in this rut, and there's no way out of it, and I'm just stuck here. I'm here to preach to you in one moment. In one moment. One visitation of the power and the glory of God in the life of Saul changed him from the worst enemy of the church to the the greatest spokesman of the church. Amen. Praise God. And what God wants to do in your life, just let him do it in one moment. God can change you. God can change your marriage. God can change your family. God can change your finances. God can change your world. God can change your addictions. God can change your situation. God can change your struggle. God can change your problem. Amen. Because he just needs one moment to do it. And it's time for the church to realize that we serve the Jesus of, uh, of glory. That we serve the one true God. And he He's able to change it in a moment. I believe with all my heart as you stand with me today. I believe today. I believe, amen, that God gave me this message, amen, to preach to somebody, amen, to encourage somebody, whether here in person or they might be online viewing us through the, the, the live stream, amen. But I'm telling you, God wants to change you. God, in one moment, can take your worst nightmare and make it into the most beautiful dream that's ever been given to a man, amen, or a woman. God, amen, wants to do it in a moment, amen. Joseph went from the prison bars, amen, to the palace in one night. In one night, God changed his situation, amen, praise God, what the enemy meant for, for evil. God changed it for the good. God changed it for the good. Where you're at right now, it might feel dark. It might feel be depressed. It might be feeling like you're frustrated. But I'm telling you, Jesus has come to change it. Amen. Jesus has come to change it like he did to Paul on the way to Damascus. Jesus wants to change your situation today if you'll just let him. Oh, somebody hear me today. Oh, somebody Bend your ear to me today. God wants to change your situation. It's depressed you. It's frustrated you. It's made you, amen, kind of hard to even to live with. 
because you're so frustrated with your situation. But I've come to preach to this group today. God's going to change it. It's going to change. It's going to change. It's going to change. It's going to change. The weapons, are, amen, that were formed against you shall not prosper, but they shall be destroyed by the voice of God, by the Spirit of God, because you are a child of God, because you are a believer, because you are a follower of Christ. Can you imagine the church as they begin to hear the preaching of Paul? And the demonstration of the power of God upon him. They never thought it was possible. Just like you don't think it's possible in your life. You don't understand, Pastor. Come on. I guess I'll have this conversation with you. You don't understand, Pastor. Mine's the worst situation that's ever been given to a man or a woman. There's just no way. God can't do a thing with it. God's not able, is what you're wanting to say. You preach it and you declare it and that Bible up there has got good stories in it, but it, it's really, really, it's just stories. God's not able to change my marriage. God's not able to change my addictions. God's not able to change my struggle. God's not able. But I come to you today and declare to you, God's fixing to change your situation. God's fixing to change your life. God's fixing to change your, your, your feelings, just like he changed Paul in one little moment. One moment of time, life was changed. And you read on, and I didn't write it down, but you read on in Acts, the ninth chapter. When Paul was converted, the church had rest and victory, and there were multiplied disciples among them. When God took their worst enemy, made it into their greater spokesman, the church lurched ahead, went to the heights that they had never been. Turned the world, they would say later, turned the world upside down. Paul was, one, Paul was the issue. Paul was the one. I want somebody to get a hold of your mind right now of this situation. Maybe a person that just seems so anti-God, just no way. In fact, they go out of their way to blaspheme God. They go out of their way to speak evil of God. They go out of their way to, to live evil. There's just no way. I want you to put them in your mind right now. And I want you to bring them to the altar today. If it's a situation that just, there's just no way. I, I can't work more. I, I can't make more money. There's just no way I can buy my way out of this you to bring that situation to the altar today because God's fixing to change that situation because the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is still the God of Peter, James, and John still the God of Paul Timothy and Titus that God today wants to change your situation but you got to bring it to him I, I invite you the altar is open Bring that situation to the Lord. Bring that person to the Lord. Maybe it might even be yourself, and that's okay too. But God's fixing to change some things in this church. God's fixing to change some things in this church. God's fixing to change some things in this church. God's fixing to do the miraculous. God's fixing to do the impossible. If you'll just let the Lord fight your battle, if you'll just let the Lord step into your situation, if you'll just let the Lord invite him in there, invite him into your life right now, invite him into your situation, amen, how do I do that? By praising him, by saying, Lord, I need you, a desperate cry, God will not turn aside, God will not turn aside, a desperate cry of help, oh, would you cry to him? If it's a person that you love so much, amen, it just seems impossible. Would you just step into their place right now, amen, and begin to pray a prayer, amen, that you wish that they would pray. Begin to pray a prayer. It's called interceding. I want you to intercede in their behalf, and I want you to take their place right now and begin to pray like you want them to pray. Begin to cry out to God like you want them to cry out to God because God's fixing to change. What the devil meant for evil, God is going to change it for good.
Shikata la 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 karotondo yaha. Ikala, that's it. Reach deep. That's it. Reach deep right now. Reach deep. Intercede. Amen. Intercede deep right now. Right now. Intercede. Ikala la baroto rondo yara la la ha. I heard what they said, Pastor. I heard what they said about the church. I heard what they said about God. It, Paul said a lot. Threatening. So he went everywhere threatening the church. But God turned him around. God turned him around. If God can change Paul or Saul, God can change that person. Yes. Yes. The church thought they were going down. The church thought they were going to be torn apart. The church thought they were going to be destroyed by this man called Saul. But God had other things planned. God had a greater plan. And that plan saved that man who became their greatest outreach, who became their greatest source of, uh, of truth. Oh, my friend, it's not over. It's not over. God can do it again. God can do it again. God's going to do it again. God's going to do it again. He cut out of the world. He told the Koran of the Namaha. 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 I believe. I believe. Oh, in Jesus' name, take my friend, God. In Jesus' name, take my situation, Lord. In Jesus' name, take God, Lord, my circumstance. In Jesus' name, Lord, reach my friend. Reach my loved one, God. Let the light of your truth shine upon them like it showed upon Paul on the way to Damascus, like it showed upon Saul. Amen. On the road to Damascus, let your light shine. Let your light of truth shine forth in Jesus' name. A new day is coming. A day of rejoicing. A day of blessing. A day of victory is coming. A day of victory is coming. A day of victory is coming. Oh yes. Oh yes. What a day. What a day. What a day it's going to be. What a day it's going to be. It's changing. It's changing. The atmosphere is changing. The light of God has fixed the sign for The light of God has fixed the sign for He cut up a car. And you turn it for God. Come on. He can do it. God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it. He cut up a lot of friends. Oh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. the enemy 